Our scripture lesson is taken again from Revelation chapter 9, page 1922, beginning at verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The word of the Lord. May we pray. Help me, Lord, today, especially with this handout, not to get bogged down in details and lose people, but, Lord, to be succinct and practical and biblical. Lord, help me because I am desperate for your help. In addition to that practical and external help, I'm praying for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, for it's only your Holy Spirit who can enable the written Word of God as it's proclaimed, to be powerful and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, grant it be so today, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, if we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, Revelation 9, what we've been looking at is these various interpretations of the chapter. And it all goes back to how we interpret the whole book. And there are several basic views. There's preterism. Preterism means that the bulk of the, of, the, of the book of Revelation happened in the first century. Uh, there's historicism, which we want to look at today, and that is saying that it is basically history written beforehand. And so when you come to Revelation 9, that is a prophecy of the coming of Muhammad and, uh, and, and the two stages of the Islamic uh, attack on, on the Christian church. And that is first in the days of Muhammad, and then later on uh, in the days of the Turks, Gog and Magog. As they come and they attack the walls of the city of Constantinople with cannon that were actually developed by a man from Poland, and they destroy the richest and most powerful city in all of Christendom, uh, namely uh, Constantinople, Byzantium, Istanbul, the city. And so those two stages of Islamic threat to Christendom, uh, the historicists believe, are foretold in Revelation 9. We're going to look at that today. And then there's the futurist, which basically says all of this is in the future. Not everything, but, but the bulk of it is in the future. And then there's the idealist, which sees basically uh, these patterns of good and evil, Christ versus Satan throughout history. So we're, we're going to focus today on the historicist view. Now the first thing I want to say is this. If you look in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22, this is important because we'll see something very striking before we look at these statements uh, about Muhammad. And by the way, if you notice in the handout entitled Muhammad, it's extremely well documented. Those statements are all taken from the Quran or from the Hadith. The Hadith is a set of documents. It's nine volumes long. I had to order it from Pakistan. It was printed in Saudi Arabia. And it is the tradition of 90% of Muslims. That is the Sunni Muslims. And particularly the uh, more fanatical branch of Sunni Islam which is the uh, Wahhabi, which can be as hot as wasabi. Anyhow, sorry. (laughs) So anyhow, you look at the back of those quotes and you'll see where they each came from. And so these are accurate statements. I want you to 
contrast all of this with what Jesus says uh, in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, he says there in, on page 1638, and some people take this one way, but if you read the whole chapter, you see another way. Page 1638, Luke 22 and verse 36. Luke 22, verse 36. Jesus is asking his disciples. This is just before he's arrested. And he, he says to them in verse 36, But now, if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that it must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And then he says, that's enough. Now hold your hand there and just look across the page at verse 51. And, uh, and, and you see something here, right there on that same page. But Jesus answered, no more of this. What's he saying? And he touched the man's ear and healed him. What's he referring to? Look at verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Now I want you to think about uh, these two verses together because they give us a basic uh, statement about several things. Number one, force, weaponry, is only really effective as a deterrent. But once it's used, the enemy understands that we may be a paper tiger. Now, why did Jesus want his disciples armed? Did he want them to use those swords to defend him? No. Don't you remember that he said that he could call on his father and the father would dispatch 6,000 angels to defend him then and there? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? So what was the purpose of the swords if they were not to be pulled out and used to chop off people's ears? The purpose was a deterrent. And deterrence is very important for nations, for families, for others. Deterrence. That is, I don't want to mess with him. That's why when I'm in lonely places sometimes, and it's been a long time since I've done this, but I'm walking in the dark by myself in maybe a dangerous part of town, I always keep my head up. I look as if I am armed and ready to kill whoever comes against me. I've never had anybody mess with me. <laughs> but that's because, and what in packing, I assure you, but it's because of how I carried myself. If you look vulnerable, you're going to be vulnerable. Jesus did not want the guards of the Sanhedrin to take his disciples. He wanted his disciples to be protected. And, and not arrested. And so Peter misunderstands. He's the one that pulled out the sword and hacked off the servant of the high priest's ear. And notice what Jesus did. He healed him. So this is really important as we begin to contrast our Lord Jesus Christ with Muhammad. I want you to look now at some quotes, and we're looking at the page entitled Muhammad. The first thing I want us to focus on, and I'll sum it up, is the reception of the Quran. Now, who is Aisha? Aisha, the mother of the faithful believers. We'll find out about her in the, in the next section at the bottom of the page under Aisha. Aisha, the mother of faithful believers. The commencement of the divine revelation to Allah's messenger was in the form of good dreams which came true like bright light daylight. And then the love of seclusion was uh, bestowed upon him. And he used to go in seclusion in the cave of Hira, where he used to worship Allah alone. 
continuously for many days before returning to or for his desire to see his family. He used to take with him the journey food for the stay and then came back to his wife Khadija uh, to take his food likewise again till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel came to him and asked him to read. The prophet replied, I do not know how to read. Now, let me give you a little background. Who was Khadija? Muhammad was orphaned early in life and was under the protection of his uncle. And uh, he began to work uh, driving uh, caravans. And he came in the employ of a very wealthy widow who was about 40 years old. That's Khadija. And eventually, the two of them married. And that was Muhammad's first wife. Now, I want you to see, if you look at that next paragraph, it is profound. The prophet said, The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more. He then released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. He then released me and again asked me to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord who has created all that exists, has created man from a clot, that is a piece of thick coagulated blood. Read, and your Lord is the most generous. Now go down to the next statement here. Then Allah's messenger returned with the revelation. His neck muscles were twitching with terror till he entered upon Khadijah and said, Cover me, cover me! They covered him till his fear was over. And he said, Oh, Khadijah, what is wrong with me? But after a few days, Raqqa died. And, and this is, uh, again, this is the cousin of Khadijah. And uh, he was like a Jehovah's Witness. What, what he believed was similar to what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. He didn't believe that Jesus was God incarnate. But Waraka died, and the divine revelation was also paused for a while, and the prophet became so sad, as we have heard, that he intended several times to throw himself from the tops of high mountains, and every time he went up to the top of a mountain in order to throw himself down, Gabriel, that's who Muhammad uh, believed he was encountering, Gabriel would appear before him and say, O oh Muhammad, you are indeed Allah's messenger in truth, whereupon his heart would become quiet, and he would calm down and would return home. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. What grabbed him? In my experience, having performed exorcisms with other people over the years, I would say that Jabriel, or Gabriel here, isn't the angel Gabriel at all, but a demon spirit. Because it has all the markings of that. Suicidal thoughts come, an attempt at suicide on more than one occasion. And, uh, and so this left him terrified, shaking, quivering. And so that's the first thing I would say. Now I want us to look at Muhammad's character. Aisha. She says, My marriage wedding contract with the prophet was written when I was a girl of six years. We came to Al Madina and we dismounted in the place of Bani al Harith bin Khazarat. My mother, Umm Ruman, came to me while I was playing in a swing and some of my girlfriends. She called me and I went to her not knowing what she wanted me to do. Due to me, she caught me by the hand and made me stand at the door of the house. I was breathless then, and when my breathing became normal, she took some water and rubbed my face and head with it. Then she took me into the house. There in the house, I saw some Ansari women who said, Best wishes and Allah's blessing and a good luck. Then she entrusted me to them, and they prepared me for the marriage. Unexpectedly, Allah's messenger came to me in the forenoon, and my mother handed me over to him, and at that time I was a girl of nine years of age. 
So what we need to understand is that Muhammad's favorite wife would pledge to marriage to him at the age of six, and that's not necessarily something unusual because throughout history, uh, infants got pledged to other infants uh, with kings and other noble people to join families together. But notice that the marriage is consummated when she's nine years old. Now, I want you to look at the next one because this is a humdinger. So there's Asha. Asha was his favorite wife who wrote down so much. And again, the Al-Hadith is not the same as the Quran. Now, notice the next statement. Behold, thou didst say to one who had received the grace of Allah and thy favor, Retain thou in wedlock thy wife and fear Allah. But thou didst tied in thy heart that which Allah was about to make manifest. Thou didst fear the people, but it is more fitting that thou shouldst fear Allah. Then when Zaid, that's Muhammad's adopted son, had solved his marriage with her with the necessary formality, we joined her in marriage to thee in order that in the future there may be no difficulty to the believers in the matter of marriage with the wives of their adopted sons when the latter have dissolved the necessary formality, uh, their marriage with them. And Allah's command must be fulfilled. There can be no difficulty to the prophet in what Allah was indicated to him as a duty. It was the practice approved of Allah amongst those of old that have passed away. And the command of Allah is a decree determined. Now that's from the Quran. Let me give you the background on that. One day, Muhammad was visiting, and he came to the house of his son, his adopted son. Uh, you'll get to meet, God willing, in a couple of weeks, two of our adopted grandchildren, and they're just as much our children as our children, I mean, our grandchildren as our other grandchildren. So Muhammad is out visiting, comes to the house of his adopted son, Zaid, and his wife opens the door. And when Muhammad saw her, he wanted her. He wanted her. He wanted to take her to be one of his wives. Now, what I see in the Quran is something absolutely contrary to what the Quran teaches about itself. See, the Quran, unlike the Bible, supposedly came to, from heaven to earth, and you'll notice that the reference there in the back is the teachings of the Quran. If you translate the Quran, it's not the Quran. The Quran can only be in Arabic, and that's really significant. It can't be translated. So when you translate the Quran, you're giving an interpretation of the Quran. You're giving the teachings of the Quran. But what I find here so striking and so convenient is this lustful man fell into lust for his daughter-in-law, and he wanted her. And then you have a revelation in the Quran for him Go ahead, you can take her. And so his son, Zaid, is forced to divorce his wife so that his father, his adopted father, can take his wife. I think this is very profound. Now I want you to notice something else as we go down. Cruelty. Allah's messenger said, The hour will not be established until you fight against the Jews and the stone behind which a Jew will be hiding will say, Oh Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, so kill him. Wow. 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 Think of that. Think of the conflicts going on right now in the Middle East. Wow. And notice here in the next statement, the apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, sat with his companions and they were brought in small groups. Their heads were struck off. They were between 600 and 700 in number. Ibn Sa'd adds that Muhammad took a Jewish woman whose husband had just been killed as part of the spoils. The apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, chose Rain Hana bint Amir for himself and ordered the booty to be collected. One-fifth portion of the goods and captives were separated, and the remainder was sold to the highest bidder. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Do you want to know why Islam was so successful? Do you want to know why it was more successful than Christianity? 
Let that sink in for a moment. What happens is, and this began when the Muslims were forced to leave Mecca and went to the city that was named in his honor, Medina. And so they had lost their houses, they had lost their goods. And so what they did was to engage in raiding parties on the caravans that belonged to the merchants out of Mecca. And here was the standard thing. You, give, you, you do a double tithe, and uh, to the Muslim, the nation of Islam, that's the Ummah, and the nation of Islam is made up of every country on earth because under Islamic law, they don't recognize these national boundaries. And so the deal is, you pay a double tithe to the Muslim Ummah, uh, Ummah, and then you get to keep the rest. And so what happens is this, and it's very striking, when they went back to Mecca and conquered, this tradition held true. So that when you met people, you offered them terms of surrender. If they refused, you killed all the adult men. Then you took the women and children as your slaves, and you either kept them for yourself or you sold, off, sold them off for money as long as you paid the double tithe on them. That's very important. And I want you to see there was this antipathy and hatred of Muhammad for the Jewish people because the Jews lived in Arabia then. And uh, he hated them because he thought immediately, when he came to them, they would immediately recognize that he was the comforter. Well, that's out of the New Testament. That he would recognize that he was the Messiah. That he would recognize that he was the prophet the sum and substance of all the prophets. And when they didn't recognize that, he turned on them viciously. And that's what you have there, where these men are all beheaded. And then on the same time that the poor Jewish woman's husband has been beheaded, Muhammad takes her to bed. Now we go further. When the prophet returned from the battle of al Kandak, the trench, and laid down his arms and took a bath, angel Jibril, Gabriel, came and said to the prophet, You have laid down your arms, but Allah, we angels, have not laid them down yet. So set out for them. The prophet said, Where to go? Gabriel said, Towards this side, pointing towards the Banu Qarzai. So the prophet went out towards them, and that's the Jewish tribe. So we, we th think of these things, and, and we're struck with something. Who was Muhammad? in the historic understanding of the church, going back as far as the Venerable Bede. The Venerable Bede was an English monk who wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation within a century of Muhammad's death. And he identified Muhammad as the character in Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. The Venerable Bede. So this is the first English commentary on the book of Revelation, the Venerable Bede, written uh, well before the Crusades. So you see these things here, and I, I contrast this with Christ. And, um, and so we'll read on a little further, heretical teachings. Notice in the Quran concerning the Lord Jesus. And notice his great antipathy for the Jewish people that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of Allah. Remember that Muhammad respected Jesus. Muhammad believed that Jesus was the greatest of all of the prophets until Muhammad. And he says, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, but Allah is exalted in power and wise. And when he says he raised him up to himself, he's talking about Christ's ascension to heaven. He's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ never died. He's saying he never was crucified. And he's saying that the Jews boasted that they killed the Messiah, but they're lying. Because the Messiah was not killed, somebody else got killed, and, and Allah hid Jesus out and then took him up to heaven. Now, how do you get to go to heaven? 
in Islam. This is very important. Therefore, when ye fight the unbelievers, when ye meet the unbelievers in fight, smite at their necks, chop off heads. Head chopping has gone on since the days of the Bible. And uh, so anyhow, smite at their necks. At length, when ye have thoroughly subdued them, bind a bond firmly on them. Thereafter is the time for either generosity or ransom until the war lays down its burdens. Thus are ye commanded. But if it had been Allah's will, he could certainly have exacted retribution from them himself. But he lets you fight in order to test you, some with the others. Now notice, here's the way to salvation. How can you know for sure you're going to heaven? But those who are slain in the way of Allah, he will never let their deeds be lost. Soon he will guide them and improve their condition and admit them to the garden which he has announced for them. Again, that's from the Quran. Now I want you to see here, how can you know you're going to heaven? I've been friends with imams. Uh, Both imams at that time in Alexandria, Louisiana, I invited to come and speak to my, uh, my history class that I taught to high school seniors. And I planted questions. And so uh, one young man asked the imam, Sir, how can I know I'm going to heaven? And he said, you cannot know this. He said, even Christians can't know this. It's because he didn't know real Christians. And uh, he says, uh, but what he didn't say (laughs) is the way you can know it. And it's right there. And read further. Allah hath purchased of the believers their persons and their goods For theirs in return is the garden of paradise. They fight in his cause and slay and are slain, a promise binding on him in truth, though the law, the gospel, and the Quran, through the law, the the gospel, and the Quran, and who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah. Then rejoice in the bargain ye have concluded. That is the achievement supreme. And reading further. As to the righteous... They will be in a position of security among gardens and springs, dressed in fine silk and in rich brocade. They will face each other, so, and we shall join them to companions with big, beautiful, and uh, with, with beautiful, big, and lustrous eyes. There they can call for every kind of fruit in peace and security, nor will they there taste death except the first death, and it means dying uh, in, in earthly battle, and he will preserve them from the penalty of blazing fire as a bounty from the Lord, thy Lord. That will be the supreme achievement. O ye who believe, when ye meet the unbelievers in hostile array, never turn your backs to them. If any turn his back to them on such a day, unless it be in stratagem of war, or to retreat to a troop of his own, he draws as himself the wrath of Allah, and his abode is hell, an evil refuge indeed. Now, with those quotes, I think you might understand if you look at the second document that I don't want you to look at now, but take it home and look at it, why the commentators understood this to be Muhammad. And in the first part of it, which ends there, at verse 11, Revelation 9, 11, that is the prophecy of the coming of, of Muhammad and how quickly they conquered Saudi, not only the all of, of Arabia, but the rest of the Middle East. And within a hundred years of the death of Muhammad, they had moved up into the Iberian Peninsula, taking Spain and Portugal and part of France, and they were stopped at the Battle of Tours. And uh, otherwise, they would have conquered Europe, the same in terms of the eastern side. So what do we do with this? And, I, and, and again, the second part focuses on the fall of Constantinople. What do we do with this? Well, a couple of verses I want us to consider is this. I concluded in my dissertation and my wife was present when I defended it, and my professor, who was from Syria, 
warned me and said, you need to remove this statement out of your dissertation. What the statement was? After I'd surveyed what people thought of Muhammad throughout history, I said, they viewed Muhammad as a satanic figure out of the pit of hell. And my professor said, you don't want that in there. I said, why is that? He said, do you want a fatwa? What is a fatwa? A fatwa is a death sentence issued by a competent Muslim authority, like an imam. And uh, it's a sentence of death that can be carried out by any Muslim in the entire world against you. And I said, well, how would they know? And he said, well, all master's uh, theses and doctoral dissertations are available worldwide to people who request them. So because my wife wanted me to hang around a few more years, uh, I changed it, and I, uh, only the statement, but you got the gist of what it is. I want you to contrast Muhammad with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. I want you to contrast uh, Muhammad with the Lord Jesus as he dies. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And this is an unusual sermon. I, I don't like to do sermons like this, but I felt it imperative in light of what is going on in the Middle East right now I thought it was imperative to cover this. And so, Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. And he is there, and he says uh, this. I must have gotten the wrong reference. Um, I'm sorry, I, I lost my reference, and it is... It is in John 18.36. John 18.36. And listen to what he says there. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper. John 18.36. And he says this to Pilate. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. And it's important to understand that Christ Jesus could have called on his Father for legions of angels. But he didn't do it. Why did Jesus not do that? Why did Jesus die? Why did he say that I must drink this cup? He's referring to his own death. Why did he do that? Jesus did that because he loves you. And he loves me. Muhammad doesn't love you. Muhammad didn't love his followers. He lusted for their wives. He lusted for their gold and silver. For their camels and donkeys and wealth. He lusted for power. Muhammad is a consummate villain in history. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the mirror opposite of Muhammad. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly dies on the cross to secure our salvation. To die in your place and, die and my place as our substitute. And that's celebrated in the Lord's Supper. Because the Lord's Supper points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We unite with Him by faith in the broken bread. We unite with His precious blood that was shed once for all time in 30 A.D., as we drink of the cup. The Lord Jesus loves you. And if you look at the history of Christianity until the time of Constantine and the legalization of Christianity and then of its becoming a state religion, how did Christianity spread? If you look at Paul's writings in 2 Corinthians, he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of fortresses. If you look at the history of Christianity for the first 300 years, following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first disciples of Jesus for 300 years did not take human life. They laid down their lives and let other people kill them. 
again and again and again, voluntarily being willing to die for the faith. Because the faith of Christianity, as following in the footsteps of Jesus, is a faith that's spread by prayer and proclamation and self-sacrifice. That's so radically different from Islam. So when, for example, they conquered Damascus, or when they conquered Jerusalem, they give terms of surrender. If you will surrender to us, if you will pay a special tax, then and, and live as a second-class citizen, uh, we'll make peace with you. But if not, we're going to kill you. And why did so many people go over to the Muslim side? Think about it. Think about it. You get to keep 80% of the spoils when you kill the enemies of Islam. And so this horde, like a horde of locusts, spreads throughout the entire Middle East and then spreads across northern Africa like a horde of locusts with stingers and killing people right and left. And you get to keep 80%. You become rich by becoming a Muslim. But the Lord Jesus doesn't promise you earthly riches. He promises you heaven. He promises you to become a citizen of the Jerusalem which is above, which one day will come down to earth. He promises instead of pleasures in this life, He promises you hardship. If anyone would come after me, said the Lord Jesus Christ, let him take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to take up the cross? What does it mean to become a believer? It's to take up a cross. What does it mean to take up a cross? It means you're sentenced to death already. And so therefore, you're on your way to Calvary when you come to Jesus. That's the promise. That's the promise. Jesus promises you eternal life. He promises you heaven. And He promises to hear and answer your prayers in a way that fits in with His overall design in history. Oh, dear ones in Jesus Christ, our world is in chaos and turmoil. All you have to do is watch the news. As you see a very violent, murdering religion that has seized the hearts of so many. My prayer for every Jewish person is the, prayer, uh, is the prophecy of Zechariah 12.10, where, he says, where the Lord Himself says, And I will pour out on them the spirit of grace and pleading. And they will look on me, that is on Yahweh. They will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for Him. Second person in the Trinity. As one cries out for an only son. That's my prayer for every Jewish person. Because without that, they'll never know peace. And what is my prayer for every person who's embraced Islam? First of all, not to become true Muslims. Who are true Muslims? True Muslims follow the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet, the Al-Hadith. Those are true Muslims. Thank God that most Muslims you meet in our country are not true Muslims. Because a true Muslim has to follow the path of Muhammad himself. And that is the way of putting others to death. I've known a number of Muslims over the years. They've always treated me kindly. They've always shown to me the respect I've shown to them. Pray to God for the Muslims around you not to be true Muslims. We call true Islam Islamicism. And it is very dangerous. May we pray. Lord, I pray that you would take these words in a very unusual sermon as I try to sketch why the historical interpreters of the book of Revelation understood these words in Revelation 9 to refer to Muhammad and his first followers and then to his later followers, the horde out of the north, Gog and Magog, who crossed the Euphrates River 
and conquered Constantinople and were outside the gates of Vienna even. Lord, I don't know if their interpretation is correct, but this I know. We are up against a satanic figure out of the pit of hell. But we thank you, Lord, that we have one who defeated Satan, sin and death on the cross as we celebrate him now in the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name, amen. This is my Father's world, and to my 